All right, we will be in Rev Matthew chapter number nine. And I realized we missed last week and so forth, uh, being under the weather and all. Uh, we came out of chapter eight, if I'll just kind of remind you. Uh, I tried to show you that uh, the information here um, is not so much the chronological order of how these miracles took place, but rather the logical order that they're in to prove the claim of the Lord that he is their king and he's their Messiah. And again, he's doing it with the miracles uh, there and so forth. And so as we begin chapter 9 now, we're going to remember that's what we're dealing with here once again is where he's beginning to do some things that are going to represent the validity of his claim to be the Messiah. And really, we'll see the rejection of the, the nation of him when they should have accepted him. So when we come down through this, uh, chapter 9 here, verse number 1, I, I, the one I, I know we're going we're going quickly. We're in like lesson twenty two or something like that, and we're already in Matthew nine. Well, we spent so much time going through Luke and in John. The details in here are the the same as when we went through it. Matthew it's dealing with that issue of of the dispensational aspect. We've. Uh, up until John the Baptist, the prophets have been the ministry. Now we're talking about the kingdom, and everyone's pressing into that. So when he's doing that, and he's moving, Matthew, that first transitional book here, we're coming out of the out of the prophets, talking about the kingdom to now the kingdom is at hand. Okay, so it's a it's a different approach. I, I was thinking about. You know, we could drag through it for three years like we did with Luke and John, but we would just be repeating ourselves greatly. So I was like, well, here, let's just get the overview, the feel of, of the book. Matthew 9, verse 1, And he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. Now, his own city, uh, that he, he now he's no longer, uh, come back to chapter 4 of Matthew. Uh, the Lord is no longer living and residing in Nazareth, okay? He's now in Capernaum. If you look at chapter 4, verse 13, And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast in the borders of Zebulon and Ephraim. He, he's, he now lives, come back to Matthew 9, in Capernaum. He's called a Nazarene. By the way, that word Nazarene is means a place of rejection. Um, he's called Jesus of Nazareth, a title that was given to him that describes him as the rejected one. That's because that's, now we come to Capernaum, and Capernaum means a place of consolation. So when we, he's, he's moved over now back into his own city. He's not in Nazareth any longer. He's up in the north, up on that coast there, uh, of the, of uh, in Capernaum, verse two, nine, verse two, and behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed, and Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer; thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, notice the verse very carefully. First of all. It's a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed, and Jesus seeing, you notice, their faith. It wasn't the man's faith. It's the faith of the men who brought him to the Lord. Okay, it's very, little details like that to kind of catch as we go. So he sees, of the, he sees the faith of the people who brought the man sick of the palsy. So he looks at him and he says, Son, be of good cheer. So the healing that's going to happen here, by the way, the healing that happens here 
really has nothing to do with the faith of the individual who was healed, but with the faith of the people who brought him to Christ. Now, in the healing mess out there today, it's always whose faith? The guy trying to get healed. You don't have enough faith. But it's interesting here in the scripture, it isn't him. It's the guys who brought him to him. So Jesus says here to him, be of good cheer. I, I love that. Uh, the sick of the palsy, son, be of good cheer. Uh, there's a, why? Because his sins are forgiven. Uh, thy sins be forgiven thee. Be of good, a, a consciousness of forgiveness of sins ought to produce joy and cheer in you. And it should have done that here. And, and again, uh, that, that issue of the forgiveness of sins here, now it's going to get the Lord in trouble as we, as we move to verse 13 here. But the fact that you know that you have your sins forgiven ought to produce good cheer. Cheer and, 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 and gratitude. <laughs> you know, even for us today, to know that we have our sins forgiven, man, that's, uh, that ought to bring uh, be joy, joy, joy. <laughs> And so forth. Now, watch verse 3. And behold, certain of the scribes and within said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? Notice that. He knew what they were thinking. And I guess if someone said, Hey, I know what you're thinking, and this is what you're thinking. You ought to pay attention to that guy, okay? But again, notice what happens. For verse five, for whether it is for whether is easier to say, "Thy sins be forgiven thee," or to rise up and walk. But that, but they, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, "Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thy house." And he arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. Notice that. Notice that. Notice what's going on here. Verse 3. They get mad at him in verse 3 because he says, Thy sins be forgiven thee. They say he's blaspheming. Okay? Now, come over to Luke 5. And, and again, that's why I kind of prefaced what we were saying in Luke about we've studied Luke and John when we, we spent time in this issue here in Luke 5 in verse 21 because Luke adds something here that will help explain out Matthew. Luke 5, 21. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemy? Blasphemes. Who can forgive sins but God alone now that's a good question if i came up to you and said paul your sins be forgiven whoop de doo what did that get you it, w- it shouldn't nobody nobody would think of anyone to come along and say hey your sins are forgiven but who can do that only god can so their reaction was a good reaction to hey this man's a little off as you know speaking blasphemies here the, the problem is, is that they didn't, go back to Matthew 9, they didn't catch quite catch on to what he says next in response to that. Because what does he say in verse 4? Then Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said. Now, that's a wonderful statement there on, uh, by Matthew on the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come back to Psalms 139. Psalms 139. Uh, it's an interesting thing when you study the Bible and you, you look at uh, textual critics, which I've been reading quite a bit lately on our, about our Bible project, trying to narrow some things down in my own thinking on the standard issue that we had brought up. Um, in within between like Cambridge and Oxford or somebody else and the thing of it is is there are little verses like this stuck in places that the new Bibles don't get to 
and don't attack because they don't know they're there. And uh, they, they are, <laughs> they usually, they'll take out verses, they'll reword verses on the deity of Christ, they attack that. You know, but Jesus knowing their thoughts. Look at Psalms 139. You found it now. Verse 1. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Who knows what you're thinking when you're thinking it? God does. So in Matthew, when Jesus says, Thy sins be forgiven... They think he's blaspheme. Go back to Matthew 9. He says, okay, you're thinking so-and-so. He's demonstrating to them that he is Jehovah God in the flesh, in their presence. And he's pressing the point with them about who he is. I am the Messiah. I am am the Christ. Now, come back there to Matthew 9. Look there again at verse 4. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts, for whether, it, for whether is it easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven, or to say, Arise and walk? Which one's easier to do? To forgive sins, or to perform a miracle of healing that demonstrates that He's the Creator? So which one's easier to do? Well, they can only, both of them can only be done by God. So they're equal. <laughs> There's not one easier than the other. If you, you know, hey, you, if you, I, I think about this and how we would talk. If you think that's any big thing about telling a guy to get up and walk, hey, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> I can do both. Why? Because I'm who I am said I am, and that is that I am the Messiah. Notice Matthew 9, verse 6 but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Isn't that interesting? Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. Again, this is a great text to prove that who who can forgive sins. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can. So they see the man rise. They they see the man get healed, verse 8. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. They see the man healed. They received it positively, conclusive evidence that Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. But yet, what did the Pharisees do? The multitude see it, believe it, get it. What did the Pharisees do? Question him. All they can hear is, thy sins be forgiven thee. They move in. They begin to to move. The reaction that the nation should have had to the Messiah being in their midst was verse 8 giving glory to God, excited. But yet, it wasn't. It was, what did they, they begin to have that evil thought and go after him. Now, it's important to notice the order here in in, in the events here of what's happening. This miracle is a foreshadowing of the the work that's going to take place of forgiving the nation, and healing the nation. And it's important that you see the order here because the order is the same order all the time. First, Christ forgives the man's sins. Then, he heals him. Okay? If it's a big problem for you guys to believe that I can forgive sins, then notice I'm going to heal him. I'll raise him up, And then you'll have conclusive evidence that I forgave the sins. So they witness some, uh, really they witness several things here where he proves that he is God. One, he forgives sins. Two, he reads their minds without them saying any words. 
that only God can do, and then, then he heals the man and enables the man to go home. <laughs> so there's quite a bit going on here, but I want you to notice the order, because the order of the miracle is important as it concerns Israel. First, there will be forgiveness of sins for the nation. Come, on, come back over to the book of Psalms again. There, then there will be healing and restoration. Israel looked for deliverance. They looked for healing. They looked for re re restoration. Psalms 103. But they were not concerned about having their sins forgiven. So what has Christ see said to them? We've already seen it. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, what things? The physical things will be added to you. So he's saying to them, hey, look, guys, all the physical things will come, but you got to get the spiritual things right first. So let's repent, get the spiritual issue right, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So when you look here, the order is what's critical. And, and I guess really the warning here is don't ever think that in the prophetic program, just because these people were promised material, physical, earthly blessings, that the spiritual side was not a primary issue because they are still the sons of Adam. They could not get the earthly, physical, material blessings that God had promised them by covenant, okay? By the way, which one of them is healing? Until they had the spiritual side fixed first. And I guess, you, uh, really, if I could tell you, don't ever forget that. Because I guess sometimes when people see the difference between the prophetic program and the mystery program, they get focused in on that material blessings and the physical blessings and everything, and they forget about the spiritual side. For Israel, we're talking about. Now, you and I, we, we get the spiritual blessings up front, and we're waiting for the physical. Israel was promised. Remember Exodus 19? Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then I will bless you. What was required first? Obedience first. Obey my covenants. Then you'll get the blessings. And that's the order. Spiritual side first, then the physical falls. Look at Psalms 103. You've found it by now, right? <clears throat> by the way, in the prophetic program, it never places the material, physical blessings above the spiritual issues of faith, it always places the spiritual issues first. In a minute, we're going to see him say, I didn't want your sacrifices. It wasn't that they were, were that the sacrifices were the issue. The issue was they weren't coming by faith in doing all that. Psalms 103, notice verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Isn't that interesting? The order. The first, the first thing he says is, I'll forgive all your iniquities. Come back to Matthew 1. And then I'm going to heal you of all your diseases. And it's always that way. First the forgiveness, the spiritual condition set, then the physical, then the healing. Now, again, the problem in Israel is that the, the problem that Israel was having was not that they would not receive the, the, spirit, the physical blessings, but they would, and they were, would have gladly taken them. But what they did was they rejected the spiritual. They rejected you know, that passage in Luke over there where they reject the counsel of God against and they hold in, uh, against themselves. They wouldn't be baptized of John's baptism. In John 6, 
He feeds the 5,000, if you remember, and they said, we'll make you king. You fed us. We'll make, you know, <laughs> and they were looking at the physical rather than the spiritual. Matthew chapter 1. Notice Matthew 1 here. By the way, later in that chapter in John 6, he says, I am the bread of life. What you need first is the spiritual bread. You get that first, that's me, and then you'll get the physical bread and you'll have everything taken care of. Matthew 1, 21. And she shall bring forth the Son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For... He shall save his people from their sins. Notice number one is he's going to save their people from their sins. His people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name, what? Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Where do they get the blessings? <clears throat> they get the blessings in that kingdom. And who's with them? God's with them. So the order. First, he's called Jesus, the Redeemer, the one who's going to save his people from their sins. Then he's called Emmanuel, which is God with us, which is where he's going to have those blessings there in the kingdom. The focus. Come over to Acts chapter 3. The focus is concerning the issue of the forgiveness of sins first because it had to do with getting right with God on the spiritual basis. And then, then we can get the earthly blessings. Um, Acts 3. I know, did I tell you that? Acts 3. You guys follow the order? The order here is kind of important because as we begin to go through Matthew, and we did it in Luke and John, we're going to see that over and over again. That order. Look at Acts 3. Look at verse 25. Now, you've had the miracle. Peter uh, and John, they, they deal with the lame man outside of the temple. Okay? Verse 25. By the way, they got called on the carpet. So they've been preaching to the choir. They should have been preaching to the choir, but they were up against the council. And in verse 25, he says, Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant, which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Basically, what Peter's telling them is, You are the people who are going to bring untold blessings on the earth. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you, and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. God sent him first to you first because it's through you that the blessings are going to go out here to the nations. So you guys got to be forgiven first, blessed first, so then you can flow it on out to everybody else. Okay? So in the miracle, go back there to Matthew 9. He, he's going to, he, he sets the order. So he says, he forgives the guy, the man's sins. And he looks over there in verse 6. Basically what he's saying to him is, Okay, so you can know that I'm able to forgive this man's sins. I'm going to heal him. And again, this is all pictures. It's all a picture of Israel's restoration and then the, the subsequent physical blessings coming on them. And it's a picture of what Christ is going to do in the midst of Israel. He's going to do it for them. He's going to, for bring, he's going to forgive their iniquities and he's going to restore them back to the position of being the blessings to the, all the families of the earth, and that's what God intended them to be. You follow that? Okay. Verse 9. Now, verse 9, <clears throat> after the miracle, Matthew sticks in something here, just kind of out of the blue, but it's about Matthew. And Jesus passed, verse 9, And as Jesus passed from thence, he saw a man named Matthew, 
sitting at the receipt of customs, and he saith unto him, Follow me, and he arose and followed him. Now, Matthew's the writer of Matthew, so he's, you know, kind of third person it here for a minute. But it's an interesting thing here when you think about who, when you read a book and they have about the author, usually, you know, somebody writes a glowing review on the back or on the dust cover, okay? But Matthew's written nine chapters already before he ever says anything about himself, and suddenly he just in one ver- in verse 9 just kind of inserts himself. Now, John and Mark don't mention themselves at all. Luke does. Luke talks about himself. But yet here Matthew come come over with me to Mark too. Matthew d- inserts himself but the but he does it very gently and he does it very conservatively. Because when we read down here, he could have been bragging big time about this. Look at Mark 2 and start reading in verse uh, 13. Mark 2, 13. And he went forth again by the seaside, and all the multitude uh, resorted unto him, and he taught them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, that's Matthew, okay, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of custom, and said unto him, Follow me, and he arose and followed him. And it came to pass that at Jesus, as Jesus sat at meat in his house, whose house? Matthew's house. Many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came to call to the right I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now notice that. Jesus is sitting at in Matthew's home, he's eaten. Matthew has brought the Lord and his disciples into his home, along with all of his friends, the publicans and the sinners. <laughs> Matthew could have entertained the Lord by himself, but he didn't. Rather, he brought in a whole bunch of, of people that needed to hear the Lord. Now come back to Matthew 9, okay? Matthew 9, verse 10. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in, notice, the house. But whose house is it? It's Matthew's house. But it doesn't tell you that in the book of Matthew. You've got to go over to Mark to get that. And when you, when you notice these things, they're placed here by the Holy Spirit, by design, but through inspiration, because of what follows now. And when the Pharisees, verse 11, um, I'm sorry, behold, many publicans and sinners, the end of verse 10 there, came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that he said unto them, heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Notice in verse 13, there's more information there than we read over in Mark. In Mark, when the Lord heard it, he just said, Hey, I didn't call, I just came, the, the whole don't need the physician, the sick need the physician, and I came to the sinners. But in verse 13, what did... What does Matthew inserts, but go ye and learn what that meaneth. And then he quotes Hosea 6, 6, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. So in verse 13, when he he quotes the book of Hosea 6, 6, and he says, you've got to go over there and learn what Hosea 6 means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I, that's Christ, am not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. What in the world's going on here? (laughs) After Christ has demonstrated himself 
to be Jehovah, the Messiah, really by three obvious manifestations. He call he then he reaches in among the outcast, the publican and the sinners. By the way, Matthew was hated by the Jews. He was a turncoat. And he calls Matthew to be a disciple. He goes into Matthew's house. He receives publicans and sinners. The Pharisees begin to raise questions. So he tells them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Who needs a physician? The man with the palsy needed a physician, not the guy, the guys who were able to walk in. The man who was sick was the one who needed to be healed. He's painting a picture here. He came to heal the sick and to call sinners to repentance. Do the righteous need to repent? No. They have nothing to repent of. Who needs to repent? The sinners. Isn't this simple? People, by the way, people break their fool necks on this, this passage. If he came to heal the sick... Well, that's what he was there to do. People that aren't sick don't need physicians. These people out here need me. That's what he's telling. You guys don't need me. You don't want me. They need me. They want me. So when he says there, but go and learn what that meaneth, I will have mercy and not, sac and not sacrifice. He said for them to go and to learn what Hosea, and it's Hosea 6.6, 6, okay? When he, and he says there, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. One, he's rebuking them for not knowing Hosea 6.6. 6. <laughs> they should have. But think about, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. You guys are sinners. You're all sinners, and what do you need? Mercy or sacrifice? You need mercy. Okay? You don't need a lot of righteous activity, sacrifices. You don't need the works of self-righteousness, bringing the sacrifices in, observing the new moons and the holy days and all that. What you need is God's mercy. I'll have mercy and not sacrifice. Now, Hosea, Matthew, the Lord's not saying that God wasn't pleased with the sacrifices. He commanded them to bring sacrifices. But how were they to bring them? By faith, of the free will of the heart, a heart of faith in response to how it pleased God, how they were to come and to do and obey. You follow that? But what do they need? They need mercy they need to throw themselves on the mercy of god and again that's <laughs> they don't you remember that the publican and the sinner praying over there and the pounding the chest hey. oh, that really sounded weird okay you know uh, you know look at me i did this i tithe on the mint and all this stuff and he and the, and the publican says i'm throws his life on the mercy seat and that's what Christ is dealing with here. He's dealing with a bunch of people who thought that they were righteous, thought that they were the cat's meow, if you will. They thought that they were God's chosen people just because they were the physical descendants of Abraham. And you know what he told them? You guys are missing it. First, you got to get your sins forgiven. It's the one who humbles himself and comes in faith. The one who casts himself on God's mercy. Not the one who performs the self-righteous activities of the religion. See that? That's what he's getting at here. Now watch verse 14. Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast off, but thy disciples fast not. Now, we've seen John the Baptist, that's disciples, pop up here, and, and honestly, they begin to have issues. 
Uh, come over to John 3 just to remind you. They were having a problem here as they began to watch the followers, John 3, of, of Christ and, and this issue about fasting. And, and I'll be honest with you, there's a lot of hokey ideas about fasting and, and, and so forth out there. You know, health and intermediate fasting is the big thing today for health reasons and so forth. But in John 3, about verse 22... John 3, 22. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing. Okay? Verse 25. Then there arose a, que a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. All right? See all that? Verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. That was John's attitude. John understood, I'm, I'm go leaving, and he's rising. He, I decrease, he increases. Now what begins to happen is most of John's disciples go follow Christ, but some of them still got the hanger honors, and that's the crowd back here in Matthew 9. Go back there to Matthew 9. They, were, they stayed with John. They became confused about some things. We'll see it when we get over in Matthew 11. They came to Christ, and what did they ask him? We fast off, but your disciples don't fast. Why is that? Now watch verse 15 and notice the Lord's answer. Matthew 9, 15, And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? Well, can they? Can they mourn? No. The bridegroom is there. You're having a good time. You do the, you, you, you know, we have weddings and so forth, and when the bride's there, man, everybody's happy. Woo-hoo, she made it all right on, you know. Same with the groom. Hey, everything's here. You're having a good time. Weddings are a wonderful time. But the day, keep reading now, will, but the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them. And then shall they fast. Notice that last phrase. You've got to understand what's going on here. When the bridegroom is with the children of the bride chamber, they don't mourn. But when he's taken away, then they're going to mourn, then they're going to fast. And what he's talking about here is the time of his rejection. Who is the bridegroom? Christ. Okay? Who are the children of the bride chamber? The little flock, the, the, the disciples. Who is the bride? <gasps> There's the big question. People will say Israel. And I usually say, do you have a verse? Okay. In the passage, the bride isn't even discussed. It's notice who's discussed: the bridegroom, the children of the bride chamber. But I don't see a bride. Isn't that interesting? Come over to Luke twelve. See, people use this and. You know, you know, they like to do that bride of Christ talk, and they pull us into it and make us the, the body of Christ. Anytime you hear anybody say that, ask them about a verse. Show me a verse that says that you and I, the body of Christ, is the bride of Christ. You got Luke 12? Luke 12? Notice verse 36. Luke 12, 36. And ye yourselves, like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding. Have you ever been to a wedding when there's no bride? She's not at the wedding here. See, you go over to the passage in Matthew 22 where the king makes a marriage for his son. Everybody's there but the bride. It's interesting. 
So if Israel, the 12, the little flock, are the bride, then 1236, we got a problem. Who's he talking to? Come over to Revelation 21. Here is the only path on your way. Get 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. I think it is. Yeah, 2 Corinthians 11. Second Corinthians 11, verse 1. Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ. That is a, the only verse that I've ever heard anyone use to say that the church, the body of Christ, was the bride of Christ. And that verse has nothing to do with you and I. We are not married to him. We are his body. <laughs> okay? Now come to Revelation 21. The term bride of Christ is bad terminology. It, it is, that term, by the way, comes from the Roman Catholic Church. That's where that term comes from. It doesn't come from Scripture. It is actually not found in Scripture at all. Have you ever have you heard of a group of people, a group called the Baptist Briders? You ought to read some of those guys. Basically, what they say is that you're not a if you're not a member of their denomination, and if you're not been baptized in water by one of their preachers. You're not a member of the Bride of Christ. But that's okay because we're not a member of the Bride of Christ anyway. <laughs> okay? Revelation 21, verse number 9 is the only passage that I've been able to find over the years of looking at this and arguing and talking to someone about anything that comes close to matching the term the Bride of Christ. Okay? Verse 9. And there came unto me, that's John, one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. That's the closest to that term that you're going to get. The, the bride of Christ, that term does not appear in the scripture. The bride, the lamb's wife, does. But who is she? Next verse. And he carried me away in the spirit to the great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was like unto a stone, most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. According to the passage, the bride, the lamb's wife, is the holy city of Jerusalem, the holy Jerusalem, the city. That's as close as you're going to get to it. But yet they, run, they use Matthew 9 to say that you and I are the bride. But in Matthew 9, there is no bride given. There's the bridegroom, Christ, the children of the bride chamber, there is Israel. Now come back with me to Isaiah Chapter 62. It's an interesting thing in the Old Testament in dealing with Isaiah 62 and dealing with this issue of marriage and the bride and Israel. Okay? Isaiah 62 1. For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the, in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. 
Thou shalt not, no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate. But thou shalt be called Hebzbah, and thy land, what? Beulah. For the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be, what? Beulah means married. Okay? How do you know that? The verse just defined it for you. For thou shalt no more, verse 5, For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. In, the old, in Israel's program, the land of Palestine is called Beulah, which means married, marriage. God will marry Israel back into their land. He will fix it so that they are never again separated from that land. You go read Isaiah, you read other passages in Isaiah, you read Hosea, and you'll see that it is as though as God marries Israel to that land, and then they become in, called interchangeably by that name. They're joined to the land and will never again be taken away from it. So in Scripture, marriage is a description of a lasting, loving union. It's a living, lasting, it's a bond of love. It's a metaphor that is used for the relationship of the Lord Jesus Christ with New Jerusalem. Okay? So before you spend a bunch of time discussing the bride of Christ, go look at some verses like this in Isaiah 62 or back there in Hosea 2, and notice how God describes how he's going to take Israel and restore her back to that relationship where God has called her husband, and he restores that covenant relationship with that nation of Israel. He gives her a bill of divorcement. He looks at Hosea and says, you go down there and marry Gomer and you have a bunch of kids and she's a whore, uh, whore, full of whoredoms and all that. She's uh, Anyway, I'll be nice. <laughs> the, the, the things that came, you know. She's a, and take unto thee a wife of whoredoms, Hosea 1, 2. That's who she is. This is and he says, I'm going to restore that. Now come back to Matthew 9. And again, I, I'm, I don't want to get all sucked into this, but you have to be careful when you begin to get around and have in our conversations and you begin to discuss the issue of the bride of Christ. Again, it's Israel's relationship. And you begin to start talking in Jewish terminologies. I, I was listening to a guy the other day about being born again. And how you and I are born again, and we're not born again. We were never born of God to begin with. And he related it over into regeneration in Titus 3, and I'm like, well, okay, I can see that giving life and stuff, but that's, Paul never says you're born again. So then why use terminology that is confusing? So when you get into it, you and I, we're described as the body of Christ, not the bride of Christ. But you know what? We're also described as the temple of the living God, aren't we? We're described as a building. Some of us look like a building. But we understand that those are figures of speech. And that's what's going on here. All right, Matthew 9, verse 16. Don't let someone pull Matthew 9 out and say, Oh, see, look, we're the bride and the bridegroom. It's not even, he, the bride's not even in the picture. Okay? All right, watch verse 16. No man putteth a piece of new cloth unto an old garment. For that which is put in to fill it up taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine in old bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. Notice, both. He's talking about the change that's taking place within the nation of Israel here. 
He's talking about when he's going to take the, na- the kingdom from that apostate nation, the old garment, the old bottle, and he's going to give it to the believing remnant, to the nation, to that new nation that's bringing forth fruits. He's going to, he's taking away, he's, we're not going to put the old and the new together. We're going to have something new. Wine is a, what, what is wine a type of in Scripture? The Holy Spirit, okay? We've got five minutes. I'll help you out. The Holy Spirit. What is a garment a type of? Righteousness. So you have his righteousness and you have his spirit. Who's he going to, who, who, to whom will they be given? Is it going to be apostate Israel or is it going to be, is it going to be apostate Israel, that worn out nation that won't get themselves right? Or is it going to be to that new nation, that believing remnant? Well, obviously to the believing remnant. You see what the Lord's picturing here now with them is that there's a new opportunity at hand. Oh, again, over there in Luke 16, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man does what? Presseth into it. The kingdom of God is available to him. John has proclaimed the new opportunity. Christ has come and identified himself to Israel. He's offered himself to the nation. He's offered that new opportunity to them. I'm not going to form that new out of that old garment over there. We're just not going to do it. I'm not going to come along over here and put new in an old bottle that will break and decay away. Luke 12, he says, Fear not, little flock, it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So there's a progression here of the program now. It's not standing still. Matthew is constantly pointing to the dispensational significance of what Christ is doing. And again, the focus in Israel was between that believing remnant and that apostate nation. And the issue in Israel was between receiving John's baptism of repentance for remission of sins or rejecting the counsel of God against them. Christ is saying the remnant is the group through which now we're going to operate, and you need to join them. Okay? John's disciples asked Christ, why don't your disciples mourn and fast like we do? And he says, because I'm with them right now. I'm here. And when I'm here, it's time for them to be happy. But when I'm rejected and taken from their midst, guess what they're going to do? They're going to mourn. So the mourning and the fasting go together. Have you ever, I mean, when you've lost someone dear, the last thing on your mind is to eat, and yet that's the first thing everybody brings over is food. Because you don't, you can't eat. You're stumped, you're just in a mess. That's the fasting. Okay? Now we'll pick up and here and keep verse 18 and keep moving along, all right? So we got pictures here. And again, Christ is, hey, it's it's time for the new guys. I'm standing right here, and they're rejecting. It got chilly in here, didn't it? Feels good. Woke me up. All right, let's keep going. No, We'll we'll, we'll pick up in verse 18 next time, okay? All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for the evening, Lord. We thank you for the folks that come out and study and to look at this. And this wonderful and important passage here. And as we move now and as we continue looking at Matthew and just everything that you you did and why you did it. And we'll just rejoice in everything that you say and do. In your name we pray. Amen.